thing. It's a little, thing. It's a little hard for us to know exactly what a system problem is. And we need people to sort of describe that better. And the same is true when we look after our own environments, whether it's something like as big as vSphere or it can be something as small as an individual virtual machine. So we have to figure out what exactly is a system problem. Right? And as we define it here, we say that a, a system problem is basically a fault in the system or with components. Quite often, it's usually something that causes a negative effect on the environment. So it's usually not a good thing when we have system problems. System problems usually mean that we we have to, you know, the environment may be down, the environment may be unavailable, et cetera. And usually they come from a variety of causes, um, configuration issues, right? Usually it's that's probably the most common thing where people decide, eh, I'm not going to read the instructions. I'm just going to throw it all together and hope for everything to work out well. That's a very common response to everything, and that's probably not the best way we should do it, but, uh, you know, that's IT. Um, in some cases, maybe it's resource contention. We've grown so fast that we just don't have enough resources, and we need to figure out where is that resource contention coming into play and where can we actually alleviate some of that. Sometimes it can be attacks, whether by network or internal. A lot of this, most recently, at, at the time that, I was, that we were doing this one, um, uh, we saw uh, the heartbeat bleed attack come out, and that was quite a significant attack that came out. Um, it can be something like that. It could be a software bug. Right? Sometimes software bugs do cause problems in our environment and making things worse. Um, or it could be a hardware failure. And that actually can happen quite a lot, even still in this day and age, where we have better hardware, faster hardware, etc. So that can also be a, a potentially a challenge for us. Each of those are things that would result potentially in our system problems. It's important to understand that there may be some things that we can sort of cover and some things we can't. Some things are easy to pick out. Like uh, my favorite was when I actually had a piece of hardware and it was smoking at the back of it. That's a hardware failure, pretty easy to notice. Um, the configuration issue is sometimes not so easy to notice because we not, may not have realized that we misconfigured it to begin with. Um, or maybe someone changed it and didn't let us know. And that can happen. Quite often these system problems can affect our environments in different ways. So it can be something like usability. So users usually come to us in a panic going, I can't use the system, oh no, I have to have it now, um, kind of thing, and that's generally not a good idea. Um, could be accuracy. Um, way back when, I remember when Pentiums were first introduced, there was an accuracy issue with the actual CPU chips where they couldn't do the floating point. Um, that's an example of a system problem that was actually a hardware failure um, and resulted in inaccuracy, particularly when it came to doing calculations such as those that we might find in Excel and other um, uh, programs that were using algorithms at the time. And that relates actually to reliability. In some cases, we have to be sure that what we're producing from our various applications, et cetera, is actually reliable data. Um, you know, is there any potential question as to whether or not that's, you know, is that in fact the data we expect to see um, kind of thing? Um, Heartbleed is a good example where potentially there was a risk that data reliability was a huge risk. So um, those kinds of ideas. And then performance, and that's actually one we hear a lot of. Oh, the system is slow. You never hear when the system is too fast, but you always hear about when the system is too slow. Um, and in those cases, that sometimes can be a really hard thing to actually determine because performance issues aren't necessarily easy to fix in one swell foop, swoop. Sorry. Um, quite often, they usually are uh, the result of multiple things going on, and it takes time. Uh, to quote a very famous um, Hollywood actor, Shrek, um, it's like an onion. You need to peel it back one by one until you find the center. Um, and it means figuring out which one of the actual, quote, four food groups, CPU, network, uh, memory, and disk, um, is actually the cause of it. So uh, that does take some time uh, into, into, uh, in, in, into consideration. Now, for this webinar, we're actually going to take a look at um, uh, what causes, or, or not look at, but we'll, we'll take a look at some ways of troubleshooting issues. Uh, performance problems are a bit unique in the fact that they do take time, and usually there you do need to take a look at things on a longer basis. So you do baseline, and you do checks, and so on and so on. When I actually, back before I became an instructor for VMware, I was actually in the global support end of things. And one of the areas I actually specialized in was actually... Uh, was actually performance and troubleshooting. Um, and I, you know, the, the reality was is that performance tickets do take time to actually figure out where the actual cause is. Most of the time, uh, it was due to, you know, 
what I call layer eight and layer nine of the OSI model, budget and politics, where this didn't have enough resources to be able to manage the environment, but those were things that we had to consider. Now, for the troubleshooting process itself, it's actually divided up into three sections within the environment. Right? So the first thing is we have to define the problem. What exactly is the cause? What's the underlying cause factor? Now, you've heard me already say we have four food groups. And it's one of those four or a combination of the four uh, that may cause a problem. So, for example, sometimes we look at a system and go, oh, the network's slow. Better get those networking teams to look after it. And the network team swears up and down, everything's fine. And if you looked again, you probably would notice at the same time that your network is slow, your CPU contention is really high. So there's an example of where CPU and network are actually tied together because we use a CPU to process the queues of packets that come in. And if it doesn't know what to do with the packet, it holds on to it. So, you know, and I've actually had a ticket that had this, which is a, why it, it comes to mind is probably the easiest example of this. But we have to remember that sometimes it's not so obvious. So it's a good idea to start when you're actually taking a look at trying to determine what the actual problem is. Look at all four of the food groups and make sure that you're actually looking at the bigger picture first to help narrow it down, down to where the smaller picture is. Right? So we define the problem. We want to figure out what the symptoms are. What exactly is the symptom? If someone comes to you and says in a panic, it's slow, that's a fuzzy term is what I refer to it. Um, slow doesn't mean anything really. Um, it could be slow is relative, right? Um, for example, I was actually at an airport recently, and the network was really, really slow. Um, I was quite convinced that my way back when 56 baud modem, 56,000, 56k baud modem would have been faster than the Wi-Fi they had. In fact, the airplane. Wi-Fi was faster than the airport Wi-Fi, uh, which was an interesting situation. To put it in an actual context, the amount of time it took me to download an update for an app, which was roughly about 50 megs, took twice as long at the airport than it did when I was up in the plane at 35,000 feet in the air. Um, so that's a really good example because now I put it in a quantitative mechanism. We want actual numbers. We want to be able to say, hey, it took X amount of time longer to do this. Um, or I'm noticing uh, an increase in bandwidth when this happens, or whatever. So you want numerical values. To help with that, you usually should have a baseline of what is good, so you can see where that goes on. Right? Gather as much information as you, as you can. There's never anything, there's no such thing as too much information when this stuff comes in play. Once you've got that, from that you should be able to identify what the problem is. And as I said, do the broader picture. You want to be able to determine what is the cause of the actual problem. Where is the actual issue stemming from? Um, and it may take some time, right? As I said, you need to look at all four of the food groups and narrow it down to whichever one's the issue. So identify possible causes, right? Once you know what the food group is, then you can start looking at, well, what could possibly have happened? Your first words out of your mouth was, what changed since I last looked at this? And sometimes you may not realize that changes have occurred. Um, I've actually had a, one customer who they swore they never they didn't do any changes at all, and it was true they didn't. But it turned out their networking team had done a change and didn't notify them of it, and as a result, that caused problems on the vSphere environment side of things. Um, so it's important uh, communication between teams, uh, but being aware of when those changes occur and what's going on with them. Once we've got that, then we want to take a look at determining the root cause. So what, in fact, is now at the, the cause of it? And once we figured out what the possible causes are, we started eliminating the things we know that can't be the cause. And when we get down to the last thing that should be the cause, it should be there. Um, and it may take some time, uh, as I said, and you've, you've heard me say this already a few times, but that is something to be aware of, is that sometimes you think that that's the cause, and it turns out it's not, and you scratch your head and look back at it. Uh, as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle put it most likely in Sherlock Holmes, you know, if we've eliminated all the possible, then the only thing that's left is the impossible. So the thing that we thought was impossible may in fact be the cause of it. Um, one of the first tickets I ever had in support was uh, someone who was having networking issues. And I asked them to check their switches and their cables. And they said, oh, our switches and cables are fine. We've checked them. They're perfectly fine. And they were saying that just because 
they viewed my query about the switches and cables as being a tier one, and of course there's nothing wrong with them. After three months, it was determined that in fact one of the switch modules was actually poor, um, and that happens. We we need to eliminate those really obvious stuff sometimes because maybe they are in fact uh, the cause of it, and it is a bit of a trick that means those of you that have lots and lots of experience probably need to set that aside. Uh, pretend that you've never seen any of this stuff before and then start going through it. Look at it through a different set of eyes. Uh, sometimes get a colleague who hasn't looked at this in a long time and get them to look at it. Um, sometimes because you're so close to it, you may not necessarily see what the cause is. So from that, hopefully you'll be able to determine what the root cause is. As I said, go through it very, even write a list if you have to. Make sure you cover everything. Once you figure out what the cause is, then it becomes a little bit easier to actually do the resolution for it. Now, in some cases, you may not be able to do resolution because maybe it's a bug. Right? In those cases, you have to wait for the vendor to address the bug, whether it's a hardware firmware update, maybe it's a hardware um, issue and they have to issue a new card or a new piece of hardware, whatever it may be, or maybe it's a software vendor, um, so maybe a new patch, um, whatever it is. So you have to take a look at the solutions. In some cases, maybe you need to figure out a workaround until such time. Um, for example, the Heartbleed one is actually a really good example, um, although not really true troubleshooting, but it was still certainly something that we had to consider. Um, for a lot of places, the workaround was to go back to the old version, go back one version, and that solved it. Right? All of a sudden, it became more protected. Um, so in some cases, it may be something as simple as that, going back a version or two, um, in the case of software, um, or not implementing the latest patch. Um, we've seen this uh, with a lot of software vendors. They release a certain patch, and it breaks you know, 18 other things along the way, and those happen to be, those 18 things happen to be the things in your environment. Um, so in those cases, you may need to adjust accordingly. And then put in the best solution. It may be a workaround initially and then a full solution later on, but whatever you can for the start of the environment just to, or, or for the initial troubleshooting until such time, a permanent solution we put in, um, you do that. Remember, document, document, document. So everything should have a documentation with it, so you have a record of the things you did, the things you tried, and what ended up working that we have a reference for future. Now, as I said, defining the problem becomes an important thing, and quite often we confuse symptom with problem, right? So uh, here we have a few examples. So, for example, if a, a, a couple of lungs out of a storage array is not visible, that's not a problem. That's a symptom of it. The actual problem is, is that the lens were not presented correctly, right? So a bit of a difference between the two. Uh, we automatically assume, well, the problem is the lens aren't there. Uh, no, that's the side effect of it. The question is, what's causing the lens not to appear? Um, you can't connect a vCenter. Right, with the with the web client or with the regular client. Uh, if, I, if it's both clients, then I have to look at, well, is the vCenter service actually even started? Right. So in that case, is the fact that I can't connect is not a problem, but rather the symptom. The problem itself is that vCenter is not up and running, or maybe the database is down, or whatever it may be. Um, I try to power on a virtual machine. Right. Side effect. That is the result of because something else can't work. Um, it could be there's not enough disk space. Usually when I try to power on a VM and it doesn't work, it usually fails. There's an error that pops up. So if there's not enough disk space, you actually may see an error that says not enough resources memory. Um, and it sounds odd, but you know, if you think about it, what happens when we create a VM, and when we power on a VM, sorry? Um, the amount of memory you allocated to the virtual machine, less the reservation, of course, we create a swap file. And if there's not enough space to create the swap file, I can't add... I can't power on a virtual machine, but swap file is memory. So, so those are all examples. I mean, and there's there's other ones you can think of as well. Remember that the the effect is what you see. The cause of it is the thing that you're trying to find, right? So the symptom isn't the problem itself. The symptom is just a side effect of what the problem is. Right? So, for example, one customer I had, where um, they said that uh, all their ESXi hosts were all at 100% CPU. Well, that's a side effect. That's a symptom. That's not the problem. The problem actually turned out to be that someone had presented uh, voice over IP VLAN to the lands of their ESXi host, which had no voice or IP services on them at all. And the virtual switches were like, well, what do we do with these things? Oh, well, hold on to these packets and hope for the best. And it caused the CPU to go through the roof. So the CPU is a side effect. The, the problem was the fact that it was a misconfigured VLAN. 
Now, one of the things we want to do is gather information. This can be something that can take a lot of time, right? Depending on how big your environment is. If you have one ESXi host and one vCenter, uh, probably it's not going to take a long time. I have two little Mac minis on my home lab uh, along with an NFS server. That's it. Um, my environment has problems. It's easy for me to go uh, and, and address it. It's a little more challenging when you have thousands upon thousands of ESXi hosts spread across various locations across the world. Um, so it does take some time sometimes to gather the information. One of the things you want to do, be thorough, but also be selective. You don't want to gather information on stuff that you don't really need. right? So um, one of the first things you want to do is gather as much information about the problem as you can. If you can repeat the problem, that's an important step. Because if it only happens one time in one odd location, it's kind of hard to reproduce, um, and it may be a, a transient issue. Um, and it's just worth, something worthwhile to watch for. If it's something you can repeat every single time, then it's possible that that's either a misconfiguration or usually a bug um, in those cases. Right? Um, if it only happens on certain systems, that's identifying it to a specific configuration issue. So these kinds of things. So you want to be able to um, be able to figure out, A, if you can repeat the problem, and B, if you can repeat it, that means you know how to verify that you've actually resolved the issue. How wide is it? How many, you know, how big is the scope? Is it everything? Is it just three servers? Is it just three VMs? Is it just this data store? Whatever it may be. And get as much information that, uh, that you need um, in addition to that kind of stuff. So one of the biggest ones is, was it working before, right? Did anything change from the point of when it was working to when you identify that there was a symptom going on? Right. And it may be a matter of contacting people who looked after it before or someone that may have looked after it over the weekend or whatever it may have been, um, whatever resource or references you have. Ideally, in your environment, you've been documenting everything. That should make things a little bit easier. And um, then you should be able to uh, troubleshoot the rest of it. Your existing knowledge. So if you have any uh, knowledge with vSphere, so generally speaking, if you've been using vSphere day in and day out for about a year, you should be able to use your existing knowledge to try and figure out where potentially the problem is and what the cause is. Right? Um, generally speaking, for example, if I have a vMotion and it stops at 10%, my first thing is I'm going to go look at the vMotion network, I'm going to go look at DNS, I'm going to look at routing. Because if it's stopping at 10%, that means it can't continue the network connection. So there's something somewhere there having an effect. Um, and I need to really watch it carefully because, of course, the numbers tend to blur and stuff. Um, so those kinds of things. So some of the ways that we can actually determine whether or not there's an, uh, a particular issue on a host or somewhere else is through the use of some variety of commands um, on the SXI host, commands like the ESXCLI, um, the ESXCFG commands. Now, the ESXCFG commands are slowly going away. I believe those are the ones. Um, and it will be the ESXCLI commands that will remain. And those commands are actually fairly straightforward. You have to get sort of used to them a little bit, but um, they're actually pretty powerful. And you can actually drill into a lot of information um, that you can't otherwise. Um, and then, of course, there's commands like the VM, VMware-CMD, etc. But a lot of the more powerful commands are actually found on the vSphere Management Assistant. Um, and that's the uh, vCLI um, uh, command line interface that comes with it, along with the Perl and, and other fun stuff. So um, the one thing we want to keep in mind is that there's more, excuse me, more than one way to actually run these commands and be able to determine what's going on in the environment. Now, as I said, uh, don't forget that you need to actually enable the uh, vSphere ESXi shell. Um, that means going through uh, the, the split screen that you see, that's that gold or, or yellow and gray screen, um, and then uh, allowing uh, access to the DCUI or doing it through the user interface in advance. You can also enable SSH. Uh, that has to be done uh, through the configuration tab of the ESXi host. Um, and you'll need to uh, not only turn on the service, but also open up the appropriate firewall ports if they're not open by default. Um, as I mentioned on the vSphere uh, Management Assistant, or VMA, we have a variety of commands, including the ESXCLI, which is also found on the um, uh, DCUI or, or the ESXi shell, and um, additional commands like the VMware-CMD, uh, which is used to power on, power off, and do a variety of things against virtual machines, and the VIACFG commands, Although those are starting to be a bit deprecated, um, they're being replaced for the most part with the ESXCLI, uh, but they are still also there as options. 
Um, and then there's, you know, various things. You can connect the VMA over to the Active Directory if you wanted to. You can do a, uh, just a regular connection to the ESXi host and, and uh, vCenter if you wanted to. It doesn't have to be Active Directory uh, connected and so on. So a variety of options available for you to actually uh, manage uh, the environment when troubleshooting. So for example, if I was having an issue with networking, um, the things I would take a look at is, and it will depend on whether it's a distributed switch or whether it's a, a standard switch, et cetera, um, and these commands that we see here, these are all ones that we would use, say, for standard switches, right? So I would leverage the VICFG-VSwitch-A and then the switch number itself, and so on. So I could take a look at what the, you know, I, I need to add a switch, I need to add a port group, I need to add an uplink, maybe I need to take a look at it. There's a, a few list commands. If I ever need to know what a command has, if I just type VICFG-VSwitch space, press enter, it will actually give me a little help and it will show me all the various commands and options I can run against that particular command, the parameters I need. If I was to use ESXCLI, in that case, it would be ESXCLI network um, see, standard, I believe, and then I can do, uh, or sorry, vSwitch standard and then list, for example, or port group list, right? So I have some options available for me uh, to do things within the environment. Uh, one of the big ones, of course, is duplexing. <laughs> you do need to have it both ways in order for it to actually work properly. And then, of course, checking to see whether the network adapter is up or down, right? If the network adapter is down, that means that the network is down and uh, we have a problem. Now, other things that may be causing a problem, maybe there's a net NIC teaming issue. Maybe one of my network cards has ended up uh, being put down into the unused by accident. Someone was playing with it and forgot to put it back. Or maybe they put the wrong um, load balancing mechanism or any number of things, right? So you want to make sure that those are actually configured as you expect within the environment that it hasn't been changed, um, et cetera. Um, maybe it's faulty hardware. Maybe it's unsupported hardware. Uh, quite often, one of the first things that you'll get when you call into support is they'll ask you if the hardware is actually on the HCL. It is always critically important to make sure that when you are buying servers that you verify that not only it's on the HCL of the version that you're buying it for, so if you bought it for 4.1, is it still in the version for 5.5? Five, five, right? You have to make sure that those versions are still supported at this point. That becomes an important part. Right? So in the example of our networking issue, VICFG-NICS-L gets you a listing of the NICS, and we can see the, the output down uh, in the screenshot. Um, and I can take a look and see whether or not this particular vendor is valid. Uh, the, um, just after the PCI slot uh, locations, we actually see the vendor make and manufacture information. And so you can use that to determine whether or not the vendor is actually a supported vendor. Um, it could be maybe the hardware is maybe misconfigured or faulty. Maybe it's got an old version of firmware. The um, LSPCI, which is basically list PCI-P, which will give you a full listing for, for everything. You can actually take a look and see, you know, which version of firmware is a particular piece of hardware at, which PCI slot is it on. Maybe there's a conflict somewhere, those kinds of things. Now, let's say I had to go and resolve a storage issue. Very similar, right, um, as far as, as, as what we would see for networking, particularly given that a lot of storage today is actually based off of networking. Um, in this case, storage may not be presented, well, is it actually a storage issue or is it a networking issue? It's one of the first things you have to ask yourself. So one of the first things we want to check is, can it see the LUN? If it can see the LUN, then we know that that part is okay, that network, networking is fine. If it can't see the LUN, then maybe that's a networking issue, not necessarily a storage issue. Um, so we'll have to verify that you know all the networks are up, all the switches are up, all the cables are okay, and so on and so on and so on, uh, kind of thing. So when it comes to uh, ESXi hosts, particularly trying to access IP storage, there's a variety of um, things that we have to sort of consider as possible causes. And in this example here, we're sort of saying, well, if we took a look at it from a bottom, uh, to up kind of thing. So, you know, is it um, uh, poor iSCSI performance? Mm, that could be the array, that could be the network, you know, anything else. Physical hardware is not functioning properly. Uh, the LUN isn't presented, that's usually an array issue. Um, the iSCSI storage not supported, that's generally not a good thing. Uh, that will actually show up in weird performance behaviors sometimes. Now, keep in mind, support is really, really key. In fact, 
particularly when it comes to storage. Um, if you're willing to take the risk, you can always have storage that's not supported, but just keep in mind that there's only so far that we can help with that. Um, if it is supported hardware, then we can go a lot farther because we can actually talk to the vendor and so on um, and address things. So it's always important um, to make sure you have supported hardware. Now, if we know that the array in the network is okay, then our next step is to take a look at the, the ESXi host and what is basically coming from it. So that includes things like maybe the data store metadata is having a problem, maybe it's corrupt, uh, maybe the NFS storage isn't configured correctly, maybe it's set to read only when it should be read write, uh, maybe there's a firewall interfering, maybe the TCP port's not open, uh, maybe it's not configured correctly on the ESXi host, maybe the VM kernel is misconfigured, maybe it's got a VLAN or something like that. So these are all examples of things that you'd have to consider for, say, IP storage not being presented properly. Right? Um, it's not necessarily just a storage fault kind of thing. Now, maybe uh, it was a VM kernel uh, misconfiguration, so maybe the IP address is incorrect. Maybe the subnet's incorrect. Um, I have fat fingered the subnet of my storage so many times. Um, you know, it, it, it can happen to any of us. It's very fairly easy. Um, uh, transposing numbers for IP addresses can happen as well. Um, and those ones are usually easy to pick out, especially if it's a really big transposition. If it's a not so big, maybe it's off by one digit, uh, you may not see it as well. So uh, those kinds of things. Now, maybe it's an issue, maybe we have issues or with vCenter, right? and that's actually a fairly common one these days. A lot of people sort of get really antsy if vCenter goes down, especially given how uh, much vCenter does within our environments. Remember not necessarily to panic. Right? If vCenter goes down, the VMs can still be up at that point, that's fine. It generally means there's no DRS happening, there's no vMotion happening, HA will still happen. All right. So those are things to sort of keep in mind. We don't need to necessarily worry about it. I'd be worried if it was still down after a week. Um, you have a bigger fish to fry at that point. Uh, but um, generally speaking, if it initially goes down, it's not something we should have to worry about too, too much at this point. Right. Remember the various components that make up the vCenter. We have the web client or the, the vSphere client. There's the inventory service, which actually tracks all the various pieces that go into the actual vCenter server itself. Um, we have the um, uh, SSO piece, um, we have the vCenter server itself, the database, the ODBC connector, um, Active Directory that it connects to, and so on, right? So there's a variety of pieces that connect to make vCenter that whole thing. Um, so it may mean that there may be a service not running at a particular time, and that's one thing to watch for. vCenter starts and then stops immediately, that usually indicates there's a problem with an ODBC connector or maybe database or who knows. Right. So always worthwhile, uh, it's always worthwhile to check those kinds of things. Um, if it's an ODBC uh, configuration, um, that can easily be fixed by just fixing the ODBC. It could be that maybe it's pointing to the wrong ODBC connector. That requires a little bit more fancier work. Um, you can use regedit to do that. Um, one word of caution, whenever you use something called regedit or regedt32, Always, 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 always make a backup of your registry first before you touch anything. Okay? It's always a good habit, just in case the worst happens. And then um, you want to make sure that you can compare the values that you have for uh, your DBBC connector in registry as well as what you actually see in uh, the actual DBBC itself. Now, in some cases, you might get to see this screen. Um, I haven't seen one of these in years. Um, it's awesome to actually see it in a screenshot. Um, this is the proverbial purple screen of death. Insert ominous music here kind of thing. Um, dun, dun, dun. Um, this generally is not a good thing. Most of the time, purple screens of death, the biggest cause for purple screens of death is hardware failure, um, and it's usually memory or CPU. You can usually tell in the first few lines what the cause is. It'll usually say something like, found CPU fault or found memory fault in this location. Um, you definitely want to make sure that when you install your SXI host, you have a location for the dump to occur, because if it's not a hardware failure, it's possibly a software bug, which means we need to be able to see it, and we need that debug information to come. Um, so it's really important that you actually create a location for a... Um, memory dump to occur, and um, that will allow us the ability to actually look at it 
and be able to uh, address it uh, afterwards. So really, really key. Make sure you have those in place with the local remote. Right? If you see one of these, again, don't panic. Um, you definitely want to file a ticket as soon as possible. If you ever get one of these, whether it's hardware related or software related, we definitely want to hear about it because this helps us build up KBs that we can leverage for these kinds of things. Um, and it may be indicative that maybe there's something else going on that we need to talk to the vendor about and find out, you know, um, is it maybe something that we've done in our software that's affecting their hardware or so on, vice versa. Um, so those kinds of things. Now, in some cases, it may be a virtual machine issue. Right? Uh, virtual machines themselves made up a bunch of files. They're fairly straightforward. And most of the time, most virtual machine issues are related to poor performance, usually because of um, contention or misconfiguration kind of uh, options. Um, generally, most of the, for most virtual machines, a lot of the stuff that they see as problems and things you have to troubleshoot is usually performance. You know, um, I had one gentleman who had a database, and it whenever he did a particular um, SQL uh, command line or command, it would take eight minutes as a virtual machine when it only took two minutes as a physical machine. And that's a, that's a performance issue. Um, as it turned out, a new version of ESX resolved the issue, um, and it brought it down to half a minute as a uh, virtual machine, which was really impressive. Um, so uh, sometimes it's software, right? Uh, but with virtual machines, it is a bit tricky. One of the things you do definitely... Now, in some cases, if we're having issues with a virtual machine, maybe it can't power on because it can't find its own disk or whatever it may be. In those cases, we can take a look at something called a content ID. You actually find these in the, the regular, the descriptor VMDK files. Um, that's the text files for the VMDKs. And those files will indicate who the parent disk is, who it thinks its parent's supposed to be. Now, if it points to something like a snapshot, then that means that it thinks that there's still a snapshot somewhere, when in fact there may not be. And that wonderful consolidate button can come into handy. So um, it is worthwhile to take a look at those. Don't be afraid to, to look inside the file. You don't have to change anything um, unless you think that maybe it's got the wrong content ID um, and you know what the correct one should be. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in some cases there may be a, a situation where we've tried to power on a virtual machine and get that level of, little, oh, there's not enough memory uh, kind of error. Um, but that's usually indicative of the fact that the data store is probably full. Um, and that can be caused by a variety of things, but the biggest culprit for that is usually snapshots. Um, whenever I have customers or students who come to me and go, oh, my virtual machines are performing slow, they're really, you know, it's really horrible, I, I don't understand why everyone's so raving about this virtual machine stuff. My first words out of my mouth are usually, do you have snapshots? Um, most people assume snapshots are a mechanism to do backups with. Um, and it's kind of a yes and no kind of thing. Backup vendors use snapshots to do backups with, but the snapshots themselves are not the backups. They are just a point in which the virtual machine can run while releasing the locks from the VMDK. Now, in some cases, sometimes some vendors or people who have played with the snapshots leave them running. They forget that they're there, and they continue to run, and as changes occur, um, it eats up more space and more space and more space until it's all gone. Um, so there's a few ways that we can um, address this. One of the first things you want to do is figure out which data source is actually out of space. The uh, df-h command is an awesome one for that kind of thing. So it determines the, the, the amount of space that files are taking, and the dash h says turn it into human format. Don't show it to me in blocks. Show it to me in gigabytes. Um, and you'll actually see it returned in, in that format. You can use the dash h for a variety of commands like ls, etc. Um, so, you know, if we are in a situation where we're running out of space, a couple ways to address it, uh, or actually there's more than a couple ways. You can increase the size of the data store. You can move some virtual machines to a different data store. You could power off some virtual machines, a whole variety of, of things that are available, depending upon your resources and urgencies of the environment. So I'm going to go over to my lab environment, and we're going to do a little bit of a demo of what it's like to actually troubleshoot. All right, so here I am in my lab environment. This is actually a, um, a virtual environment that I have. And um, here I'm actually looking at it through uh, my cloud director. And I can actually see my V app. And
I can actually access, and I do have access to, uh, my ESX2 is the one I'm actually going to use. I'm going to break my ESX2 um, within the environment. So I made sure that I have access uh, through there. Um, I had to enable the uh, direct console user interface. And if I go, and I already peed over to one of my um, desktops where I can actually uh, run various commands within the environment. So I have my vSphere client, and as you can see here, um, my ESX02 um, uh, has a, a few virtual machines on. Now, none of them are powered on, which is fine for my purposes. Um, I'm going to do some troubleshooting. Real world, you may have some VMs that are, are powered on. Obviously, don't you know play and practice troubleshooting on a live production environment. Um, a test environment like this makes perfect sense. Um, and then I also have uh, my VMA, which I had open um, just a few seconds ago, um, and I have its target as being ESX02. So this allows me to target commands specifically to that particular host. So for example, if I was to tighten this, um, I can see, say, what NICs are listed on that particular host. And so I can see it has um, all of these NICs. There's a total of uh, six um, within the environment, uh, right? So um, I can actually see uh, what's available there. Um, Wrong command. Uh, oh, there. So it, the most of the commands actually do have a dash L um, as an option. Usually commands that relate to devices or, or things like that. So I was just trying to see what storage I might have within the volume. Um, I can see the switches, route. Mm, big challenges that. So I'm going to do ESX CLI instead. Um, and the CLI is actually what I call a progressive build, so you actually add on the things you want. So, for example, if I wanted to look at, say, storage, I can see the storage commands are my options. So I'll type ESX CLI, storage, I'll just type it by itself, and it will give me back a help if that's not the final state. Um, so if I want to take a look, I'll put the up key. Um, I have NFS, so let's see what it says about NFS. NFS, add, list, remove. Okay. So I'll do the up key again, and then I'll do list. And it shows that I have this one actually listed and mounted at this point. So as you can see, it helps me to be able to see the environment. Now I can visually see it. I'm a little old-fashioned. Um, I, I have the vSphere client installed. I didn't get the web client installed just yet. But one of the things we want to make sure is when we before we do troubleshooting, you should do this after you build systems, is get to know what they look like. Right. Um, so, for example, in this environment, I'm taking a look at the memory, what the system memory is in the virtual machines, um, what storage I have. I've got four data stores. What networking I have. So I can see that I have a, a four v switches, actually five, sorry, and no distributed switches. They're all standard. I can see the storage adapters. Um, I can see my network adapters within the environment. And the advanced settings, if I wanted to really go through them, the advanced settings I tend not to, to touch. And then any power management settings. Again, this is not something that I would be using in this environment. Um, and then I could go through the other settings as well. The big thing is getting to know your environment, right? Now, so I have this, I have this. And I also have PowerShell open. Now, the, to help us be able to show you sort of what it's like to troubleshoot, um, I decided to borrow some of our scripts that we have from our troubleshooting class and actually use one of them to break the environment. Um, these are some uh, Power CLI scripts we created, um, and it's kind of neat. The troubleshooting class is actually one of my more favorite classes, and it has like 50 labs that um, you actually run the scripts to break. It's awesome. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'm one of those people that likes to break things. <laughs> my goal is to always break it and fix it because you actually learn far more when things go wrong then when things go absolutely perfectly. Not to say that we don't want things to go well. Um, we always do because you don't want to spend all day trying to fix and troubleshoot stuff. Uh, but on the chance that you might need to practice this, that's what the, that kind of class is for. So um, we do have some uh, scripts here. We'll do DR and I'm going to go into module five. Now the module five scripts I know happen to be about networking, which is actually kind of a perfect thing. Um, so I'm going to 
run one of the scripts. And I should run script 5.3. That's going to take a few minutes for it to do what it needs to do um, within the environment. And we'll open this up. Now I've deliberately uh, closed down the tasks. That's this here. Normally you'll see this and it automatically will list all the things that are going on within the environment. Um, I'm actually going to probably move this over a little bit just because um, it sometimes gets confused. So auto hide and put it on the left. So the reason why I do that is that, uh, actually, maybe not auto. Oh, no, it should be fine on the auto hide. The reason why I do that is that sometimes when I go down trying to get to an OK button, it's actually below where that is uh, within the environment. So let me get into here. It's still doing its script. That's fine. I have to wait for a few minutes. Uh, click around to see if anything changes as we're waiting. So I did enable the SSI shell and the SSH. Um, I did that so it makes it easier for me if I have to troubleshoot directly in it. Now, by default rule, you really shouldn't have them enabled on a day-to-day -day basis. The only time you enable those is when you are troubleshooting or need to do something in command line. Uh, command line access via SSH and or through the GUI, uh, or sorry, not through the GUI, sorry, uh, through the uh, DCUI um, should not be a day-to-day -day activity. It should only be done where it's absolutely necessary. All right, so something definitely has happened. Apparently I've lost my network connectivity. So let's see what I can do through here. I suspect, oh, actually that one I'll leave. That's not the one I want. This one here is what I want. I suspect that I probably won't be able to pass any commands because it's probably something with my network. So let's see if I can get in. Oh, I can still get info. That's nice. So one of the things that we have to sort of keep in mind is that, remember I talked about the fact that some things are a symptom versus what the actual problem is? In this case, my symptom is the ESXi host cannot connect to vCenter. Um, it's not the problem, it's the symptom. The problem, my initial guess, my hypothesis, is that potentially the management network is down, right? That would be a fairly decent indication that there's probably something going on. Now, to start my troubleshooting, one of the first things I did was, that, as I said, I said, well, let's see exactly how far down it is. The fact that I can actually get this information back is a pretty strong um, indicator as to where the problem might actually be occurring. Um, in my case, most people, you look at this, oh, it's down, I better reboot the SXI host, or I better check the management port, or I better check this, or I better check that. Um, and that may not be the case, but let's double check it just to be on the safe side. We're going to go through and check all of these kinds of things. So I'm going to use the um, older command. It's a little more familiar for me. We'll pipe it to a more. Um, and actually what I'll do, that font may be a little big. Let's change it down. We'll change the font down just one. So let's do the command again. All right, so now I can actually see them all. All right, so my VM NICs are still there. There are all the NICs that we had before, all in the right place. Okay, so that part I know. Um, VMK, no VMK FS tools. Take a look with the CFG dash BMK Nick. Let's see what we get there. Oh, that's all there. That hasn't changed. Is that the same? Not available. Hmm. That's an interesting thing. Uh, 
but I'm still able to connect to it. So I know that it's not necessarily the network made down. That may not be necessarily an accurate thing because I didn't look at this beforehand. So I don't remember if this was actually supposed to be up or down in that case. What else can we look at? Well, we have the next one here. Oh, let's take a look at the ESXCLI command. ESXCLI and network. And let's start with Nick. And we'll do a get. Since it tends to be me and Nick zero, that's where our management port is. Hmm. Let's let me try that again. Looking for the syntax, just so I can see. Ah, I forgot the dash in. That's what I needed. Okay. Get dash in. Be in Nick zero. Okay. So it can actually get information from the Nick itself, and it seems to be up. Here I can see its status is up. It's detected a link status, so that means that's good. Um, yeah, it looks like everything's fine for that one. Set to auto negotiate, which means it should go to the full one gig. Hmm. All right. Hmm. All right. Well, let's clear that out. We'll go back to our network again, the SXCLI network. What can be our next option that we can look at? Oh, vSwitch. There's an idea. All right, so let's clear it out. Remember, up keys are always helpful. We'll go to vSwitch. Oops. Typos don't help though. So go to vSwitch, wait for it. Oh, and I know I didn't have any DVS. So let me actually just double check and uh, make sure that we don't have any. Maybe that script put one in there that I don't know about. Test. No DVS switches. All right, so that's good. We'll go back, we'll go to standard. All right, so I want to see my standard switches. And oh, that's long. All right, so what I'll do, because it is still long, I'm just going to pipe it to a more command just so I can control the scrolling of it. Um, so my vSwitch server, which is where my management port is, has VM network and management it's by itself, that's fine. We don't have beacon enabling or anything else that's really odd. Okay, nothing on vSwitch 1. All of those all look okay. All right, clear. So now I can look at, let me look at the IP address. So ESXCLI network, you go by itself. And the reason why I want IP is because it looks at the VM Nix, as you can see here, VMK Nix, right? So we'll clear, we'll do P. And, ah, the second one, interface. Operations having to do with creation, management, and deletion of the VMK network interfaces. Perfect. So we'll go interface. Take a look at what those are. Ah, there's a list option. That's perfect. So interface list. And it's a long distance. Let me just clear this out again. All right. So everything looks fine here. And yet, so I'm looking at all of this. I'm able to pass commands through let's try something just to verify because the measurement network tends to be the same one as SSH. So let me move my putty over here so I don't trigger off the start menu. And ESXIO2. Yes. Ah. So this tells me a lot. The fact that I can SSH a measurement network means that that works fine. So networking is not an issue. 
there's something else at play. Well, this is where my vSphere client is. My vSphere client, in order to connect to the ESXi host, or in order to connect to anything, must go through from here to the vCenter server and then from the vCenter server to the host itself. Now it's able to get to vCenter, but it seemingly can't get to the host. So let me think about this for a second. So when I go from here to the ESXi host, I'm using 443. That's easy enough to test. I don't know if we have internet enabled on here. Oops. Oh, apparently we do, because I can get out to the internet. All right, so I know that that works. So that would explain the connection to it. But the connection to the ESXi host is done through port 902. Um, and 903, those are additional ports. Ah, maybe the issues with the client, and specifically, let me go to my control panel, and we're going to go to security and settings. So the client, and specifically, let me go to my control panel and we're going to go to security and settings and oh i think i've got the wrong hang on a second here Let's see if i've got the right one i think so we'll check it out ah there we go oh, the windows firewall is on let me check my rule set. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort it by name and see here, because I happen to know. Oh, well, look at that. Someone turned off a firewall rule that I need. In order for me to connect, I have to have that heartbeat that comes from the host. If I don't have the heartbeat, then the host doesn't exist. Well, let's enable that rule. It appears someone turned it off. Well, that's silly. I'm going to double check the outbound rules just to make sure no one's done anything there as well. So, let's see if there's any vCenter ones there. I don't see any vCenter ones, so I don't have to worry about it. So, I'll leave those ones alone. I'll close this. Close this. Make it back to my vSphere client. Oh, look at that. It's back. Wow. Well, let me see if I fixed it. Now, <laughs> Unlike the real world, you're not going to have a verify script that's going to say, oh, look, you fixed the problem. Um, in my case, I do, because in the troubleshooting class, we have that. And look at that, I fixed the fault. Um, but this is a good example. So let's think about this for a second. So our initial symptom was that the host disconnected. And the actual problem wasn't that there was a network issue, but the actual problem was a misconfigured firewall. right? So the problem in this case was someone had misconfigured the firewall thinking that that did not need to be opened and that it was potentially a security risk and therefore we should close it. Um, and that obviously caused problems for my environment. And as you can see, really simple little thing that you turn off and oh, look, you have no connectivity whatsoever outside of command line. Now I could have also tested if I want to go a little further using the vSphere client directly to the host and that would indicate that there's something specific with where my client is um, as far as uh, the vSphere client is concerned. Uh, and its connection to vCenter and what was going on there. So a neat little um, challenge. And hopefully it's giving you an idea of sort of the kinds of things that you can look at in order to resolve issues. Sometimes they're not so easy. Sometimes they're a lot easier than they, we think. All right, so back to the slides. All right. So hopefully all of this has been really helpful. One of the big things, this is something that I'm a huge advocate of, in that there is no such thing as someone who knows everything. That is impossible. There's just too much stuff out there to know. The more important thing is, do you know where to find the answers? And a few ways to help improve your own troubleshooting is to check out some of these resources. Uh, the Communities Forums or the VMTN Forums are an excellent location to go to actually find out and get help for stuff really quickly. Um, we have a wonderful community, uh, sort of grassroots kind of thing that's grown over the years, of people willing to help each other try and figure out what's wrong with the environment. Um, and it's a great place to actually go, especially if you have some weird, unique software that no one else has kind of thing. 
jb.vmware.com are the knowledge-based um, locations. Really, really good uh, other resource to go to. Uh, VMware Support has been turning a lot of their support tickets into actual KBs. So before you call, check. Maybe your answer is just a few keystrokes away. Right? And that can make things a little bit easier, especially for some of the more straightforward kind of stuff. Um, check the release notes. In the release notes, quite often we'll indicate where particular things won't work well with others um, on our latest release. Right? So it's worthwhile to check just to make sure that whatever it is that you may be looking at or maybe trying to troubleshoot is in fact supported in this particular version. Or if it's a known issue, then at least you know that it's being addressed. There may be a workaround listed in the release notes as well. You can use the command line interface documentation to help you get to know the command line options you have available to you um, within the environment. And of course, the vSphere Management Assistance documentation. That can also help you navigate that particular environment and be able to um, go through those kinds of things. Now, there is some training you can take, of course. Uh, for some people, learning in front of somebody else is actually a little bit better. Uh, we do have some free training in the form of the data center virtualization, what's new fundamentals, and resource management fundamentals. Um, and of course, there's the install configure class and the design workshops. But the two that come to mind when it comes to troubleshooting are definitely optimize and scale and troubleshooting class. The optimize and scale is all about how do we optimize our, our performance of our environments, you know, what things do I look for if I'm having performance issues, et cetera. Whereas troubleshooting is a um, break and fix kind of environment. It's about 20% lecture and 80% labs. There's 50 labs you go through to try and troubleshoot and actually fix your environment, so to speak, um, and make it work well. And there are some that are easy and some that are really, really head scratchers kind of thing. Um, so really, really good idea. Uh, we will have a few links to each of those as well as links to the various learning specialists in your area uh, for more information about those courses. Now, right now we do have a promotion going on if you are interested in taking one of those courses. Um, there's a 15% discount as well as potentially a free VCP exam voucher. That's always a good thing. Uh, it's hard to say no to free. Um, and if you're in the Americas, there's even some extra ones as well, including some free stuff. So uh, definitely check out the links again for the Americas, Europe, and Middle East, and Asia Pacific. Now, of course, why does all of this have some relevance for you? Well, for people like you know, yourselves, once you get your VCP, the question always becomes, well, now what? I'm a VCP, yeah, so does everyone else. Now what do I do? Oh, there is a next level certification. That is the VCAPs, or VCAP exams, known as the VMware Certified Advanced Professionals. And there's one particular exam in there that this particular stuff, troubleshooting, she applies to, and that is the uh, data center administration exams. Um, the administration exams themselves are all live lab exams. You actually have to build an environment according to the questions and make it work, and there will even be some broken bits in there. So your ability to troubleshoot becomes really, really important in passing that particular exam. Um, so it is worthwhile to uh, check those out um, and uh, see what's coming up for those ones. Now, this particular session is being recorded, and you can play it back at a later time. I believe there will be an email that will be sent out with that information in, um, as well as I believe we're going to uh, have some information in the chat window. And don't quote me on that one. Um, uh, but that said, we will have some more of these webinars coming up, including on June 12th, we'll have an introduction to NSX, Register Now, Space is Limited. And then July 29th, we'll have storage-based policy management with a virtual SAN. Now, yes, the vSAN, one of the neat, great inventions. Uh, from my point of view as a EUC or VDI type of person, those are, that looks uh, pretty awesome in the environment. So uh, watch your emails for uh, upcoming uh, registration information. Um, they will uh, show up in a follow-up email. So. Um, if you have questions, by all means, put them in the chat window. I do want to thank my helpers that have been helping me today answering the questions. Um, I know you guys have probably been peppering them with lots and lots of interesting stuff um, and probably lots of uh, my environment doing this. <laughs> um, so hopefully we've been helpful. I hope this uh, session has been helpful and hope to see you soon in another webinar near you.